In this last video, we're going to talk about two final theories. We're going to spend most of the time talking about what's called a non-cognitive approach to metaphor. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about this view that's mentioned as well in the Kemp and Reiner interactionist theories. But we're going to focus on non-cognitivism. Non-cognitivism is very different from all the other theories we've thought about metaphors so far. Because the other theories, they sort of share a common presupposition, which is that even though they say something different from the literal content of the sentence, metaphors use, are used to assert something. So they have this shared picture that, well, with a sentence like, man is a wolf, well, there's the literal content, and you don't assert that, but there is some other thought or belief that you want to assert, that you want to say is that, that you want to say is some thought or proposition that you think is the case. Now this thought or belief, it's not the same thing as what the sentence literally says. So when I say man is a wolf, I'm not trying to express a belief that man literally is a wolf. But the kind of thing I'm trying to express is of the same kind of thing as I might express with a sentence like that, literally. It's the same kind of thing that I would express with a declarative sentence normally. It's a belief or a thought. It's something that I can assert to be the case. It's something that could be true or false. It's some sort of comment about how the world is. So both the simile view and the Gricean view, they both share that kind of picture. Metaphor is a way of, of asserting that something is the case, it's just, not your, it's just not what the literal content is that you're asserting. And this is exactly what a non-cognitive view rejects. It rejects this idea that using a metaphor is a way of asserting that something is the case. So we can sort of break the non-cognitive approach down into two parts. So firstly, it denies that, metaphor, that uses of metaphor or assertion. Um, the metaphorical assert, utterances assert things. That's a sort of negative part. But of course, we would like to know, if they don't do that, what is it instead that they do? This is where there's kind of more variation. There are different ways you could spell out the view. But one particularly influential way of understanding it that comes from a philosopher, Donald Davidson, is that basically what metaphors do is that they they try they cause the audience to compare the things in the metaphor. So while I'm not asserting anything else by saying man is a wolf, I am causing my audience to start paying attention to the two, to putting the two things, the two ideas together, and I cause them to note certain kinds of similarities. So we could very we kind of oversimplify and say the positive part of it is that they cause the audience to note similarities. But here the non-cognitivist wants to say, this is actually very importantly different from asserting that there are those similarities. As you saw in the Camp and Reimer, there's a way Davidson puts it as like, well, if I sort of was able to like knock on your head and was thereby able to make you see some similarities between humans and wolves, I wouldn't thereby be saying that they are similar. I'm just causing you to see that they're similar. Now, at least on the Davidson way of spelling it out, this idea of causing your audience to see similarities, it's more like sort of a knock on the head causing them to see the similarities rather than an assertion that they are the same thing. So it's very important that this idea of causing them to see the similarities is supposed to be quite different from asserting that, that that's so. So this is a more radical view of metaphor than the views we've seen before. The views we've seen before try to reduce metaphor to something else, something more familiar. The first one tries to reduce metaphors to similes, the other tries to reduce metaphors to implicatures. This is a view that rejects all of this and says metaphor really is its own kind of thing, we shouldn't try to reduce it to something else. And there are some good reasons to have a view like this. The main motivation comes from the thing we mentioned at the end of the last video, which is that when you try to paraphrase a metaphor literally, it seems extremely difficult, at least in certain cases. In all these Shakespeare examples, you really struggle to try and come up with a literal content that the metaphor could be saying. 
So the non-cognitivist notices this, and they say, well, maybe that's just reason to think there is no literal proposition that we're, we're expressing. The reason why we can't say the same thing non-literally is because we're not saying the kind of thing that we could say non-literally. We're just like, we're doing something completely different for making an assertion. That's why we can't assert the same thing as we do using a metaphor. It's because we don't assert things with metaphors in the first place. We're making a deep mistake in trying to reinterpret them as assertions. It's, that's just not what they're doing in the first place. And that's why attempting them to paraphrase them as assertions is doomed to failure. You're trying to turn them into something that they're not in the first place. So that is the main kind of motivation for the non-cognitive view, this idea, the, no, the observation that metaphors are difficult to paraphrase in literal language. Non-cognitivists take that to be a reason to think that they're just a completely different thing in the first place, and we shouldn't try to uh, understand them as asserting things. The problem is that there actually is some evidence to think that, they, that metaphors do assert things. And there are two specific ways you might sort of make this case. One is by thinking about disagreement. When somebody makes a metaphorical assertion, it is actually sometimes possible to disagree with them. And not just disagree with the literal content, but disagree with whatever they're trying to do with the metaphor. So for instance, suppose well, I, there's a mutual acquaintance of ours, call, call them Billy, and I say, Billy is a real vulture, meaning something like he preys on people or he waits until they're weak to pick them off or something like that. And you, maybe you have a much higher opinion of Billy than me and you say, no, Billy isn't a vulture. That's not true. That's not fair at all. So there's a disagreement here. But clearly we're not disagreeing over whether Billy physically, literally is a vulture. It's common knowledge that he's not. There are no, we know that there aren't that human beings are not vultures. We know that this person is not a vulture. We're not disagreeing over the biological facts here. But it does seem like there's some disagreement going on. It looks like there are some sort of features I'm attributing to his personality that you're denying. And both of the way, and both my way of asserting that and your way of denying it are metaphorical. When I said he's a vulture, that was a metaphorical way of attributing these things to his personality. When you denied that he's a vulture, when you said he's not a vulture, it looks like you're denying that he has these personality traits. You're denying that the comparison is apt between him and a vulture. It's a little bit hard to see how any of that would work if we're not asserting propositions. Because it looks like, because denying something, that's the, that, that is the kind of thing that we only really seem to be able to do to assertions. I can't deny a question. If you ask, where is Billy? I can't, I can't say, no, that's not true. I can't disagree or deny a question. Similarly, I can't disagree or deny uh, an order or an imperative. If you say, close the door, I can't say, that's not true, or I don't agree with that. I can refuse the order. I can refuse it by saying, I won't do that. But I can't deny the order. I can't deny it like I would deny an assertion. So first of all, it looks like only assertions are the kinds of things that we can deny in the first place. But if we can deny the kinds of things that people say by using metaphors, well then that looks like a pretty good reason to think that, at least with some metaphors, what they really are doing is asserting something. When I said Billy is a vulture and you denied that, I was asserting something and you were denying the thing that I was asserting. It's hard to make sense of how of what was going on in that exchange without saying in the first place that I was asserting something that gets rejected later on. So that's the first problem for the non-cognitivist view. How do you explain denial? How do you explain rejecting metaphors if metaphors aren't themselves assertions in the first place? The second problem comes from what are called dead metaphors. So dead metaphors are these expressions that are really common. They're words that sort of started life as metaphors, and then the metaphorical meaning just sort of turned into the literal meaning. So these are really common. When you start looking for them, they really start jumping out at you. But a very simple example is like talking about like a chair leg or the leg of a chair. Now, it seems like the expression a chair leg started life as a metaphor. Like when we talked about the legs of the chair, we're using the word leg metaphorically. We're referring to a particular part of the chair, but we're referring to it with the word we use to talk about parts of our own body because there's a certain kind of resemblance. But over time, what's happened is that that stopped being a metaphor, and chair leg, it literally means a 
It literally means this part of a chair, like the parts that keep it up. So it's not a metaphor anymore. The, if I say something like, a chair has four legs, that's not a metaphorical claim. It's a literally true claim, because in that context, the word leg just means part of a, part of a chair. So that's the phenomenon of dead metaphors. And the question for the non-cognitivist view is, well, how do you actually explain what, how dead metaphors come about? Because what the non-cognitivist is saying is that there is no meaning, there is no thing you're asserting beyond the literal content whenever you use a sentence metaphorically. You're just trying to cause the audience to see this kind of comparison between the two things. It's not like there's something else that you're saying. For instance, if I, you know, when we started using, so just to focus on a concrete example, Let's take the sentence, the chair has four legs. The way the dead metaphor comes about is, well, we start off using sentences like these metaphorically, and then eventually, because they just sort of become conventional, the word legs takes on this additional meaning, the additional meaning of chair legs. It seems really easy how to understand that if you think that metaphors were making assertions all along. Because if you think that when the sentence was used metaphorically, there's some other, there's some other thought that you're expressing. There's some other assertion that you're making. The explanation for the dead metaphor is to see what the new meaning of legs becomes, or the new additional meaning. You know, you just ask, well, what were people saying all along with this metaphor? What were they asserting all along in this metaphor? In particular, what kind of thing were they asserting that the chair had four of? that thing that you're asserting the chair had four of, that becomes the new meaning of legs. So if we are saying that metaphors are used to make assertions, it's much easier to see how dead metaphors happen. The word legs takes on the meaning it has in the metaphorical assertion. But this whole story presupposes that there's some assertion you're making in addition to just saying the literal content of the sentence. The process of acquiring this, this new meaning, it presupposes the idea that there's something else that you're asserting whenever you say this sentence non-literally. And remember, of course, this is exactly what the non-cognitivist is denying. They're, say, they're saying, you're not asserting anything else. There's no other thought you're trying to express when you say a chair has four legs, when you started off saying it metaphorically. And the question is then, well then how do you explain the fact that if we keep saying this thing long enough, it stops being metaphorical and it starts being literal? The natural explanation is, well, the new literal meaning is just whatever the old metaphorical assertion said. But if we're denying that there ever was this extra metaphorical assertion, then what happens? How does this sentence get a new literal meaning if it's not the old metaphorical one? So that's the problem of dead metaphors. And both of those problems point to thinking that maybe metaphors do express assertions after all. Because to make sense of how we can deny a metaphorical utterance, an easy way to explain that is by saying that they make assertions. To explain how things could become dead metaphors, again, an easy way to explain that uses the idea that metaphors do express assertions. And in both cases, it's hard to see how the explanation would go without the idea that metaphors express assertions. So that's the non-cognitive view. It has an important advantage. It does explain this phenomenon of why metaphors are hard to completely paraphrase in non-metaphorical language. The non-cognitive explanation is the reason why it's difficult is because it's impossible. You're trying to do something that's impossible, and that's why you can't succeed. But there is some evidence for thinking that, after all, metaphors do make assertions. We can disagree with them. And there's also this phenomenon of dead metaphor. Before wrapping up, I want to talk, quickly talk about a final view that was mentioned in the Camp and Reiner paper, which is this interaction view of metaphor. They discuss it briefly, and they're right that the view is very vague and itself metaphorical. That's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, because it's not very well worked out. But I do want to say some broad things about it, and suggest that it may be sort of thought of as a middle ground between the non-cognitivist view and the Gricean view. So the interaction view is one that says you're asserting something when you use speech metaphorically. But they deny a different kind of presupposition that the other theories made. So both the Gricean and the simile theory said, well, there's a difference between what this sentence literally says 
its meaning on this particular occasion, and the assertion you use to make it. So there's the literal content, and you're not asserting that. Rather, there's, there's a metaphorical content, and you are asserting that. So what the interactionist view sort of says is that, well, there actually sort of isn't a difference between these two things in the first place. And the reason is because on the interactionist view, what's really happening is that when you use some words metaphorically, is you're temporarily giving them a new meaning. So for example, in this case, where I say Juliet is the sun, what's going on is, it's not that this sentence has a literal content, which I'm then, you know, asserting something on top of, really what's happening is that I'm temporarily reinterpreting the words. What's happening is that there's a special kind of context sensitivity going on in examples like this. So that's a little bit difficult to get your head around, so it's, it's helpful to think about a comparison. So let's take a sentence like, I am hungry. And let's just imagine it as said by two different people. Yes. On one occasion it's said by Alice, on one occasion it's said by Billy. They say the same sentence. But of course, when they say the same sentence, they don't really mean the same thing on each occasion. When Alice says this sentence, what it means in her mouth is, Alice is hungry. What it means in Billy's mouth is that Billy is hungry. So they use the same sentence to express different thoughts or express different propositions. They don't say exactly the same thing with this sentence. Now it's important to notice something that they're not doing, what we're not saying here. We're not saying that when Billy, we're not saying that like Alice is hungry, that this is the meaning of the sentence once and for all. What we're saying is, well, it kind of depends on the context in which you use it. In use in this context, it means one thing. In use in this context, it means another thing. It's not like it really means Alice is hungry all along, and that Billy is sort of metaphorically using it to express something else, or it's like he's implicating something beyond it. That's not how we want to describe what's going on here. What we, what we want to say is it just means different things on different occasions. And this is sort of the way that the interactionist is thinking about metaphorical sentences. Because, let's draw another picture, and focus on this sentence again. And let's imagine it as spoken by two different people. Here we have Alice, and let's suppose Alice is using it literally. Here we have Billy, and let's suppose Billy is using it non-literally. When Alice says it, what she's trying to express is, you know, maybe she's confused or something like that. She's trying to say, Juliet literally is. When Billy says it, he's, well, he's saying something that's hard to express, but let's just put it simply as, like, Juliet is glorious or something like that. Let's simplify and assume that that's what Billy means on this occasion. So what the interactionist is saying is that, well, the sentence, it just means, it, it, it just has a different meaning when Billy says it than when Alice said it. Sort of like the way that the sentence, I'm hungry, has a different meaning as said by Alice than said by Billy. What the words actually means changes depending on the context. And in particular, when we're in metaphorical contexts, when we're trying to say things metaphorical, metaphorically, the words take on a special meaning. So in a way, the, the interactionist is denying this thing we've been saying all along, because we've been saying all along that often metaphors are literally false. The interactionist says, well, no, metaphors aren't literally false, because you're just, you're, and the reason you said that is because you're mistaken about what the sentence says in that context. We don't think when Billy says, I am hungry, it's literally false, just because Alice could have said it as well. We think that in that context, the word I means Billy. 
Similarly, the interactionist says, we shouldn't think that when said by Billy, the sentence Juliet is the son is literally false. It just means a different thing when said by him than it means in normal contexts. It doesn't mean, the sentence doesn't mean that she is a planetary body or she's a celestial body. It doesn't mean that that kind of thing that it means in literal context, it just means something else. And the something else it means is true. How does the interactionist find the new thing, the new thing that it means? Like, well, how do we find this new meaning of is the sun? What determines what the new meaning is in metaphorical contexts? This is the part of the view that's extremely vague, as you'll have seen from the Camp and Rhymer. Max Black, who is one of the main proponents of this theory, talks about sort of using the idea as a filter or something like that, but the description is extremely metaphorical. The idea is sort of similar, though, to the Gricean explanation, because the idea is something like, well, we take the meaning, we take the word is the sun, or the expression is the sun, and instead of using it to pick out, you know, the actual sun, we use the words to pick out some properties that the sun has. So maybe in this context, we temporarily use the, the phrase is the sun to just mean is glorious or is bright or is worthy of worship or something like that. The meaning of the phrase shifts from its normal meaning to meaning things that are associated with the stereotype of its, of its normal meaning. So in a, in a metaphorical context, the phrase is the sun picks out things that we stereotypically associate with the sun rather than just meaning the sun itself. This is a kind of interesting view, although it's hard to spell out. The reason why I wanted to talk about it here is because the advantages closely map onto what we were saying before. We said that the problem for the Gricean account and the thing that was good for the non-cognitivist account was that it's very hard to say what metaphors say in literal terms. It's hard to paraphrase them in literal terms. The interactionist view might explain why that is, is because, well, the reason why it's hard to express in literal terms what we say using metaphors is that, well, we don't have words for them in the first place. That's sort of why we make these words up on the fly, because we don't have ways of expressing them. The whole point of using a metaphor is to fill in this gap in our language. We temporarily give our words a new meaning, and that's how we, and th and that's how we, ex that's how we express what we want to. The point, of using, of, the point of metaphor is to change the meaning of a word to fill in a gap in our literal language. The other advantage, though, is that it, it not only potentially explains the expressibility problem, it doesn't have any problems that the non-cognitivist approach has. It can perfectly well explain why it makes sense to disagree over these things, because you still are making assertions. Now, you're using the words in a non-standard way, you're making up a new meaning for them on the fly, but you are asserting something that somebody could disagree with. It can also easily explain the phenomenon of dead metaphors. Because the idea is, well, this meaning that you come up with on the fly, if you keep using it often enough, it just becomes part of the actual meaning. You change the, you change the meaning facts by using it often enough so that this becomes not something you mean on the fly, but just an extra thing that is standardly there that we can draw on. So that's why you can kind of see this view as like a nice middle ground in some ways between the Gricean account and the non cognitivist account. It has an interesting explanation about the expressibility problem, the kind of thing that motivated non-cognitivists, but it doesn't suffer from the problems that affected non-cognitivists. There is an obvious problem with this account, though, which is that it really is very vague about how this, how this process of coming up with a new meaning works. Like, how exactly do we figure out what the new meaning of is the sun is, or how do we figure out what the new meaning of is a wolf is? What, what is this process? This is something that, especially these early accounts, really haven't said very much about. And I think this is more of a problem here than it was in the implicature account. Because at least with implicature, we know that there are implicatures. We, we have tests for them. We have a good idea of what implicatures are. And we have a good explanation for why the theory would be vague. The reason why the theory is vague is because it, what the best explanation of the violation of a maxim is, well, it depends a lot on the circumstances. This kind of account doesn't have a similar doesn't have a similar defense of its vagueness. It really needs to say more about how does this new meaning arise? What are, what are we actually doing when we come up with this new meaning? So that's a big challenge for the view is to say more about how, how this process works. And I think Camp and Reimer are, are right when they, when they say that this is a serious problem. Okay, so to sum up what we did in this video, we start off by talking about the non-cognitivist view of metaphor. So that the non-cognitivist was motivated by this idea that it's very hard sometimes to express metaphors in literal language. 
For this exact reason, they deny that metaphors really do assert things after all. And that, has, that it, it does give it an important advantage. It, it explains why it's so hard to express metaphors literally. But it has some disadvantages. It struggles to explain disagreement of how you can reject metaphors. It also struggles to explain the phenomenon of dead metaphors. I talked a bit at the end about this alternative interactionist view. On the interactionist view, we do make assertions using metaphors. The thing is that we're sort of thinking about, the interactionist says, we're thinking about it in the wrong way when we think about, when we say that in cases of metaphor, there's a literal content that's false. The interactionist says the right way to think about it is the words just change their meaning. They don't have the literal meaning in that circumstance. They say something different. And this could potentially explain, give a different explanation of, of the expressibility problem. You might think the whole point of using words metaphorically is to fill in an expressive gap in the language in the first place. There are some steep challenges for the view, though. The main one is to fill in the details of how this coming up with a new meaning process works. The details on how that goes tends to be extremely fuzzy, and that might seem worse here than it did in the case of implicature.